author Adi Kamin has said, a good book has no ending. And as an avid reader myself, I think I completely agree with him. What I'm describing is how book lovers feel about reading a good book. Imagine being a writer and be able to write and pen your thoughts into something that all others can enjoy. To see an idea bloom into a beautiful story, a seed that can you know, transplant into a plant bearing fruits of creativity. A very good morning to everyone present here and making yourselves available uh, to uh, us today. IMB Alumni Office welcomes you all in this author talk series. I am Priyanka, and it's a privilege to welcome you all. Today, we are joined by our esteemed guest panel, Mr. R. Venkatraman and Mr. Bhasan Mukherjee. They are both alumnus of IMB batch of 1988. Mr. Raman has three decades of corporate experience. His first job was with Tata Motors as a trainee. He later worked with other corporate giants, and his last dedicated responsibility was with A.T. Kearney as a senior advisor. Now, Mr. Raman does an array of things. He's an independent director at companies. He also teaches at IAM. He also mentors a consulting firm and budding entrepreneurs. Furthermore, he is the author of many books like Conspirator, Fraudster, Insider, Saboteur, and, men and many others. He has a large fan following and is fondly called as the John Grisham of India. His white collar crime fiction, all set in India, gives the readers a sense of familiarity and hence he has a huge fan following. His latest book, A Will to Kill, is however his foray into the world of mystery novels. Set in the backdrop of Misty Nilgiris and feel of Greybrook Manor, it feels like an Indian Agatha Christie. It is his first book in the series that is to follow. We welcome you again, sir. Thank you. Our other panelist is Mr. Bhasal Mukherjee. After he graduated from IAMB, Mr. Mukherjee worked with various international banks like Bank of America and HSBC. His last role at HSBC was as the head of personal retail banking business for the Southern India. He is now director at Bridgepoint Solutions Private Limited. Mr. Mukherjee is founder promoter of Bridgepoint Solutions, which offers tailor-made consulting and training solutions in the banking domain. When not at work, he pursues his interest of theater and travel. His latest book, It Happens, Stories of Human Relationships, is a compelling collection of 15 short stories that talk about different aspects of human relationships with twisted, intricate emotions. Both Ashwin Sanghi and Amitav Ghosh have endorsed his writing because his short stories in the Write India contest for their prompt win in the top 10. Each story is different from the other, having an out of blue turn in the end. These ends add a complete wonder that remains as an afterglow as the stories have ended. As though he calls, or, and although he calls himself an accidental writer, his readers call him a miracle worker. They find his narration beautiful, riveting, and thoughtful. We welcome you again, sir. Thanks. Lovely to be here. I will request our audience to hold on to their questions till the end of the session or type in their questions in the chat section. We will surely address them later in the session. Thank you. <clears throat> Now we would like to begin the session by talking to both the authors about their latest books. I would like to start with Mr. Uh, Raman, where he can talk about his latest book, A Will to Kill. Mr. Raman. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Priyanka. And good morning to everybody. Pleasure to be here. Uh, my latest book, A Will to Kill, is my experiment that I postponed by four or five years in that, uh, when I started writing crime fiction, of course, I wanted to write something like a, a Christie kind of a novel, uh, but that's a very difficult thing to write and I didn't have the confidence to do that. Uh, it's far easier to write a thriller. So what I did was I fell back on my experience of the corporate world. 
uh, and I started writing uh, crime fiction, which became Fraudster, and then three more books followed. After writing four such books is when I started having some confidence that I will be able to pull off a murder mystery plot. Um, I wrote this Will to Kill, and uh, thankfully the publishers liked it. And uh, it seems to be doing all right uh, in the markets. One of the most um, surprising things about Will, uh, Will to Kill for me is that, see, I usually take something like six months to write a book. Uh, I wrote this Will to Kill in 50 days, uh, less than two months. That's because the whole, uh, uh, the whole sequence of events had been bubbling up in my mind for so long that when it came to the actual writing, it happened very, very quickly. Uh, so Will to Kill is a murder mystery set in uh, the Nilgiris, as uh, Priyanka said, uh, in South India. Uh, the story is set in a very familiar uh, environs for the Christie and, uh, and uh, Dixon Carr kind of uh, fans. It's a remote uh, country house, a manor, uh, where there is also a haunted valley in the background. Uh, there is a party that's going on and there's a landslide happens and every, everybody gets care, uh, cut off and surprise, surprise, murder happens. Uh, so that's what it is about. Uh, it'll all, Will to Kill has been received well in India and more happily it has been picked up by a US publisher as well. Uh, and it's going to get published uh, on 1st of December, 1st of next month in the US. Uh, and the next year... Um, uh, a, a, a UK copy will also be uh, published in the in England. So let's see how it goes. Back to you. To go grab a copy because I know this is the first in the series and there will be a couple of books after this as well. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mukherjee, next, you know, uh, next to you, you know, um, we can we hear, we know what is your book about and, you know. Yeah, thank you. About, thank right? you. Thank you, Priyanka. Good morning to everyone. And thank you for joining in on a Saturday morning. Uh, my book is an anthology uh, and it's called It Happens, Stories of Human Relationships. Now, uh, this anthology should have happened much earlier, but it just didn't uh, because these are these comprise stories which I had majority of them submitted for the Write India contest, which as many may be aware is a crowdsourced platform along with authors where they give a prompt every month and uh, you are supposed to create your story in the canvas of your choice um, and uh, within 3000 words. So a lot of my stories uh, had got picked up or they featured among the top 10, uh, uh, you know, Ashwin Sanghi, Tuhin Sinha, uh, Upamanyu Chatterjee, Amitav Ghosh, Nayantara Sahegal, uh, Vivek Shanbag. Uh, uh, but the fact is um, that these stories were, are, are predominantly from a, a season one and two. So at the end of season three, I suddenly realized that I have 30 plus short stories. Uh, and there were also a couple I'd written for uh, the Commonwealth uh, Short Story Writers Contest. So we decided to uh, put together 15 of these stories which deal with a myriad of uh, human relationships uh, covering you know, love, uh, hate, humor, uh, alternate sexuality, incest, fatalism, ethical dilemma. Um, and what we have, what I have attempted to do is uh, essentially try and create a compendium or, 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 or a collection uh, of fundamentally everyday people. So these are stories and people who you perhaps can reach out, touch, identify yourself with or someone else you know very closely. Uh, so and this uh, this book has come out uh, fairly recently. I mean, because of the pandemic, uh, the 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 hard copy has just come out this month. Uh, the soft copy came out uh, in May, and uh, it's 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 it has been received well. And I just hope that uh, you know this is actually a start as far as I am concerned. Although I did write for a number of uh, anthologies, but they were all as contributory contributing authors as a contributing author. So this is my first solo attempt. And uh, I do have a couple of novels as well, but uh, I enjoy writing short stories and uh, it happens as a collection of 15 of these. Over to you, Priyanka. Okay. I, I, my, my next question to you is that, you know, how, how did you motivate, I mean, you know, where, where uh, writing at a later stage so how, how did you, uh, how does interest develop? Did you always want to be a writer? 
So, so Priyanka, I missed a bit of in the middle because I think you got, uh, there was a problem on the connectivity. Can you repeat the question? If it's for me, I don't know if it's for me or not. Yeah, that's true. Okay. No, I'm just, uh, I was just asking the both of you that, you know, uh, the writing has come to both of you uh, fairly, you know, at a later uh, part of your lives. So was, did you always want to be a writer? How, how you know, where did this inspiration to be uh, a writer come from? Venka, do you want to answer? Sure. I'll go first. Oh, have I always wanted to be a writer? I guess probably, yes. It's somewhere at the back of my mind. But, you know, with a family to build, uh, to raise a career to build, uh, and one never had time. Now, around the time when I was approaching 50, um, I started considering what uh, the, my life after retirement. And the biggest thing that kind of frightened me was the inactivity. When you're working 10, 12 hours every day, six days a week for uh, 30 years, after that, a sudden silence is, is frightening. So I wanted to develop some kind of an intellectual hobby that I can continue after, after retirement. And I took a shot at writing. Earlier, what happened was when my boys, I had two boys, um, when they were in school, uh, they are both uh, you know, great fans of uh, Lord of the Rings um, and uh, Star Wars. So when we were talking about Middle uh, Tolkien's Middle Earth, one of the boys said that, that can we create a world of our own. So we said, why not? And we started creating a world. And then once we created a world in our own minds, uh, they said, uh, can we write something? So I wrote something and that went on and went on. It took a life of its own. And then it ended up with a, a fan epic fantasy series, which I did not publish. There was absolutely no intent to publish. Then when I reached about 52 or so, uh, some others outside the family read the fantasy and said, uh, boss, you need to publish it. When I went to the publishers, they essentially, most of them said no, because they said, if you can tweak your stories to fit into Indian mythology, then we will consider it. I, I bought at the, at the prospect. I said, no, I don't want to do it. Uh, so I ended up publishing it. Uh, I said publishing it on Amazon under a uh, pseudonym. And then when I retirement was going to happen, I said, let me take this seriously. Maybe I can write. So I wrote my first crime series fiction, which is Fraudster. And it so happened that Hachette at that point of time was looking for something along those lines. See, in the Indian market, there is a huge shortage of crime set in corporate India. I think the only other person I know who writes that is uh, Ravi, Ravi Subramanian. Um, so, um, Hachette was looking for something like this and it so happened that my manuscript went to him, to the CEO, the MD of Hachette, and he said, first we want this. Then we edited it, wrote it, and then they signed me up for uh, three more novels. So that became the four novels. So that is how I ended up entering writing. Uh, right now, if I look at what is my objective in writing, it's basically to give me a intellectual hobby going forward. I hope I will be writing as long as I can. Uh, that's the primary thing. The secondary thing is, there's always this urge to create something from nothing. It's, it's very satisfying. Even if nobody buys a single copy of your book, it's fine. But just the thought of creating something is kind of nice. So this is how I got into it. Basha. Right. Um, well, you know, I was uh, inclined artistically in school and college. So I did a lot of uh, public speaking, debating, uh, you know, a uh, lot of plays, theater. Uh, I used to play the tabla also when I was a kid. So I, it was there in the family, but I never thought I would write seriously. So even, uh, you know, when I, when I quit corporate life in 2005 and then got busy setting up my company, it was only in 2014 that uh, I had written a short story and someone read it and said, you must submit it. So I submitted it, it got selected and that's how it started. So again, there was uh, no consciousness to actually uh, start writing, but uh, I echo what Venkat said in terms of uh, the fact that the, the whole ability to create your characters, to deep dive, to do a research on the background of the premise, try and develop a layered plot. And uh, it all becomes, it was a lot more challenging, I thought, when, when you're trying to do all this in a short story. And that's why I started fundamentally writing short stories. 
and at some point of time I, i said okay let me also try my hand at a novel and i have written two of them but they have not yet got published and looking for a publisher at this point of time so that's how it happened it was i was very much of an accidental writer but once i started getting a little bit of you know my story started getting picked up there was obviously a lot of uh, enthusiasm going forward to create uh, different kinds of stories so that's how it happened okay uh last of my question is 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 for you your your book is about human emotions and relationships uh w- was there a special i mean well, well, was there, there a special inclination for uh, for writing to you know about the subject was there uh, any uh, specific idea behind this no actually um, you know i i do write a lot of with on human relationships because human drama intrigues me to me a human is the most complex uh, creature on this planet and uh, you know it's very uh, it's very enticing to write about them because you can create multi layered characters um so that was one thing uh, which which enticed me and also what happened is i realized that if i look at my 30 stories i realized that a lot of them are deal with human relationships but i am planning to come out with a second lot of them which are all centered around death so they all have death as a theme in some way or the other and that could cover you know cover things like uh, um, things like a like like a like a crime or a you know thriller it it could cover things like euthanasia so it it goes it takes the whole span but yes i like writing about human relationships because i think that's very fundamental and very central to uh, uh, to to the to what i call a character conflict which i think basically drives a story very often i believe the character conflict drives the plot and it uh, helps me to write about uh, or i like writing about human human relations because uh, a lot of readers i mean you know uh, uh, a lot of the reviews uh, that you have got for your books a lot of your readers have said that you know somehow it it you know strikes a chord with every reader a st- you know everyone has uh, all your stories have something to offer to all its readers so uh, just wanted to know you know that uh, have you you know got inspiration from people around you or, or it's just something that uh, you have come up you know, there have been inspirations like for example there was i was once traveling on a train and there was this uh, uh, there, there was this blind guy who was uh, who was selling tops okay so you know he uh, he he then what was happening is there were a group of children who picked up four or five of his toys and he went uh, he 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 went crazy because he had to report to his whoever he had uh, purchased it from and so i created a story around it there was another time i was traveling on a flight and there was this lady who was going to get her husband's last remains and uh, everybody was treating her quite because you know she was not you know the classy type so they, they they were looking at her quite strangely and so on but then there was actually a guy who came in from the military and saluted her and took her off the craft so i created a story around it so yes there have been events and i'm sure we all come across relationships or you know events in your life and they somehow stick somewhere in your memory and when you want to write i hope they come out and say give me a chance to express myself so that's how it works okay now my my next question is to you uh again this is about you know what your readers say about your book now some of them say that you know uh, all your uh, white collar crime thrillers uh they have you know very similar um uh, uh instances in in our real life uh, scams and uh, or you know these uh, bank frauds that happen around us and so your your plots come very very close to them so have you gotten you know has it been an inspiration from the corporate world or it's just deja vu that you know you come up with something and and, and a similar thing uh, you know comes up well it's very much connected to what the kind of work that i had done now as a management consultant for uh, for three decades uh, my i did work across several sectors financial sector uh, manufacturing various things now I, when you go into advice companies both in india and overseas when you go into in, uh, advice companies on their operation strategy how to do better you come across a lot of loopholes right and you meet a lot of people uh, who know about this loop cause there are many people who have different motivations so if you look at the corporate world it has the entire slew of uh, emotions that is there anywhere else uh, greed ambition everything fear everything now if what i decided to do is i picked up four different industries which i knew reasonably well and said what is the kind of white collar crime can i 
construct here. So the first one was banking, so which is basically a loan fraud. We all see that almost every six months, three months in the newspapers, so that happens a lot. A lot of it is when if you read it, you will you will also come across internal processes in a bank. What happens? So one, I had a reasonably good idea of the loopholes there and how the fraud is done. So I wrote that. Second one is um, about stock markets. It's about insider trading. Insider trading happens in India. It happens overseas. There are many different ways. Uh, but the law is very weak and it's very difficult to implement whatever little laws you have. So insider trading always fascinated me. We know that people are doing, a lot of people are doing. Rajat Gupta got uh, jailed for that. Uh, uh, and uh, Goldman Sachs is a big name, right? So uh, very much based on my experience with in the financial sector, then these third and fourth books were uh, e-commerce and media. Uh, e-commerce was booming then and it's booming now. And there are 20 different ways in which you can do a fraud. I constructed one uh, for the book. Similarly, the last one, Conspirator, is about media. You know, it's about fake news and, and paid news. The idea for, um, uh, for Conspirator came after a discussion I had with one of, an owner of one of the largest uh, media uh, groups in India. I had a discussion with him in which he was asking, listen, I as a uh, as a uh, news vendor, whether it be it uh, TV or newspaper or whatever it is, I have this ability to influence people. I have this ability to influence their action. I have the ability to influence their purchasing. How can I monetize it better? Right? I am not worried about what the editor says. I am the owner. If why should I treat two different companies? Let's say two companies A and B. One gives me a lot of advertisement revenue. One doesn't give me very much. So why shouldn't I help A? So that was the confidence conversation he had. And from that conspirator happened. So actually all of them, even the second book, Insider, which is an insider trading, was based on a discussion with a CFO who was talking to me about a company where he was made an offer of about 35 lakhs per annum. And he said, that's very low. But then when I talked to that MD, he said, you would get 35 lakhs here, but you have the ability to you know, make completely different volume numbers outside. And I asked, what is that outside? He's talking about insider information. So that became a story. So at least the first four books, uh, the corporate crime is very much based on Indian corporate uh, stuff. Okay. okay. So I now now I understand, you know, what, what, what the, the reviews are really about because a lot of them are very similar. And, uh, you know, this was a personal question as well. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> my, uh, I want to ask both of you, how do you take time for, for you know, uh, what is your uh, demands of writing a, a book? How do you uh, devote time to writing? Um, I know that, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Raman works, I mean, you know, uh, he's got uh, fairly more independence and and uh, he can has a more kind of you know control over his time for for writing so um, and uh, mr bhaswar has you know he's a director and, and at his uh, company bridge point uh, solutions so how do you uh, take out time for for your writing you're right bhaswar runs a business i don't <laughs> so he is a lot more busy than i am but as far as i'm concerned see i am completely unstructured in the way i uh, approach this for me fundamentally this is a hobby this is not a profession so I don't want to be pressured into doing anything. So I will do it exactly as I please. There will be times when I write like a madman. I write uh, eight, 10 hours uh, uh, a day. Sometimes three, four weeks will pass by, two months will pass by, and I will not write anything. Fundamentally, it is enjoying. Much of my writing is done after dinner because that's when everybody is asleep and you know you can have a cogent uh, chain of thought. Uh, but otherwise, anywhere and everywhere, I never uh, get into deadline. I'd never agree deadlines with my with my publishers. I will do it the way I want to do it. So time is to answer your question anytime, uh, whenever I feel like it. I have a separate uh, study in my house. I'll go there, sit and do whenever I want to do it. So is is there a problem to you know pick back from you know if, if there is you know a, a bigger gap between your writing schedules? Is is there a difficulty picking back from where you have uh, ended it? Uh, yes. Answer is yes. Now, if the break is short, 
then there isn't an issue. Sometimes what happens is like now, right now, I'm trying to formulate a science fiction story, right? And uh, just three days back, I heard back from my UK publisher on the edits of the UK edition. So I have to leave my story that I'm, uh, I'm constructing now and then do the edits for Will to Kill and then get back to Then that becomes a bit of a problem. It takes a day or two to get back into stream. See, fundamentally, at least for me, I I need to, if I'm writing a, a book, like in Will to Kill, I need to mentally get into that space, you know, that environs the... Uh, with those people around me kind of a thing. Uh, so that takes a little bit of time. I have the same question for, for Bhaskar. What, what are your, uh, I mean, you know, how, how do you take out time from your schedule? Okay, this is, uh, this is, has been a very, very difficult thing for me to do, especially because um, I'm quite acutely aware, as most writers are, that the book is not going to earn my bread and butter. So <laughs> I need to devote a lot of time to my company. Uh, and, uh, but what has happened is, you know, <clears throat> uh, I don't know if it's, a, if it's a part of your corporate training, but typically racing deadlines has become is a part of the corporate world, right? <clears throat> so a lot of the sto short stories I wrote were basically before the deadlines were going to expire. Uh, because I do spend a lot of time researching the story and the premise, because I believe that unless you, uh, you are able to uh, write something credible, you will not be able to draw in the reader. If the, and if the reader does not believe you, it does not believe your story. So um, uh, because of that, my writing has been <clears throat> typically racing the deadlines. But having said that, uh, I remember once demonetization happened and the whole, uh, you know, a lot of things went wrong, including the entire space where I am in, our company is in, which is into training and consulting. So, uh, you know, for the beginning of that year, which is 2017, if I'm not mistaken, because it happened in November 16. So 2017, the first three months, we suddenly realized that all the, corp you know, all the corporates who we were working with said, we are putting everything on a hold because of this whole problem. Uh, and so I suddenly realized that I've got nothing to do. My company has nothing to do. So for three months, I sat down and I wrote a book. All right. Now, what I believe, and you know, uh, that's a big, uh, big problem for me because it requires, to me, it's a very, very lonely pursuit. Okay. And it requires a huge amount of discipline because it's something which nobody else can do other than yourself because there's, no, there's nothing else which will make it happen rather than you're doing it. And the other thing which I've also mentioned in a number of places, you know, it's typically like a ketchup bottle. You keep shaking and thumping and nothing comes out. And then suddenly there's a huge deluge. Okay, there's a flow. So uh, again, I'm very unstructured, but um, I like, you know, I, I work well when there are deadlines. But having said that, and especially when you're writing something like a novel, which requires a lot more tenacity, because you're writing, you know, you're trying to hammer out so many numbers. The number of words are much more. I think it requires a huge amount of discipline and that's something I'm working on. All right, so that's work in progress. All right. Okay. So what according to you are good elements? I mean, you know, what are elements of, of good writing? Is that question to me? Yes, that, that's, for, I mean, that's for the both of you. So. Okay. Um, okay, the first thing is, um, as uh, you know, very, very important as I, I keep mentioning this is research. So, you know, whatever you're writing on, you need to make that credible. Uh, but one, what happens is typically, especially when you're writing a short story, you are so enamored by your own discovery of the premise that very often you fail to realize that it's a, it's a, it, there is a word count, 3,000 words, and you have to very quickly move to the plot. You can't keep hanging around in the premise. But yes, creating a credible premise is very important. And from there, you move on to your plot. For me, plot is important. So I plan it. But very often what happens is your, you know, the muse takes me by her hand and <clears throat> sometimes I find that I'm going way away from whatever was planned in the plot. And that happens a lot. Uh, the third thing which I, uh, which I, which I work on is a lot of, uh, because that's very important to me, is character conflict. Because unless there is an internal conflict which somebody identifies with, uh, the, 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 the story does not become uh, very meaty. So for me, character conflict is very important. And sometimes for me, the character conflict drives the plot rather than the other way around. Okay. Uh, then finally, uh, the other very important thing for me, of course, especially for a short story is the ending. So I, I do like, like sledgehammer endings and you know the surprise or twists and tales in the endings, but it cannot be forced. It has to come in the natural flow of things. Otherwise it, sound, it looks very, or it reads very contrived. Also, these are the fundamental elements as far as you know, writing short stories for me are concerned. Well, for me, uh, 
I'm not sure, you know, but uh, I basically feel that there are no rules in writing at all. You know, you go to the internet, you get, you have a, there's a deluge of advice on what you should do, what you should not do, so conflict, and then uh, you have uh, plot points and this and that and all that stuff. Now, all that is there in the web, so people can go read that up. To me, the most important thing about what you produce is credibility. And um, I do have a problem with a lot of new authors, uh, um, India, overseas, whatever. They have good characters, they have good plots, but it's not very credible, right? In the sense that within the universe of your own story, it has to be credible. You might be writing a fantasy story, with you have magic and all that stuff, but within that universe, it has to be consistent. Now, for example, there is there was a uh, there was a book that uh, uh, a crime novel that came out uh, four or five years back. It starts wonderfully. It starts with uh, somebody being killed and hung up in the highest um, uh, telephone mobile telephone tower in Bombay. Right then, after that, there's a series of uh, deaths. Uh, these bodies are here, are uh, strung up at very impossibly inaccessible places. Now, I was, I mean, that was very, very good, the first part, first half. Then I was, as a reader, I was looking for how did somebody manage to get his victims up there? And when the, when the book ended, there wasn't a convincing way in which it was done. So that, an extremely good plot, good characters, great writing, didn't have credibility. So I, at the end, suddenly I lost uh, kind of, it was a very good book. I, there aren't too many crime fiction writers in India and very few of them write well. This guy writes extremely well, but it was not credible. So to me, it is credibility. I, I, I think I know the book you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, talk about this. Uh, as as authors, you have a lot of of power in your hands, the power of of language. How do you control that? Uh, I mean, you know, should it be controlled? There, there should be rules for for it, or how should you know one use it? How should one exploit it? Okay. Uh, see, uh, I think before answering that, like, that's a fundamental point. Um, what is your writing doing in the world? If you have a social context to your writing, then the question that you ask is you know, hugely valid. For somebody like me who's writing uh, mysteries and thrillers and about fraud and stuff like that, um, my writing is not a vehicle of giving any kind of message. To, so to that extent, the power of words is far lessened in my case than compared to somebody like Bashwas, right? Uh, so when I come back to my kind of writing, when I look at writing, I, I kind of look at it in three buckets. There is some, some people write extremely well. The language itself is what you're reading for. Woodhouse is one of them, right? At the other end of the spectrum are people who write so badly that the writing comes in the way of the story. But the people in between, people like Agatha Christie, people like Conan Doyle, Alistair MacLean, all these guys, they write good English, but it is neither very language-wise, it is not hugely inspiring, nor does it come in the way. It is very effective communication, right? So as far as I'm concerned, words are, uh, I use words only as effective communication, but in my several places in all my books, I have some descriptive passages, which are aimed at evoking mental images, right? So for me, that is the power of the words. I don't go into the social context at all. What about you, Bhaskar? Uh, to me, words uh, are important uh, in, in the sense of creating imagery. Because what happens, uh, I believe, is that whenever you're writing, the reader is always trying to you know, get ahead of your book. The reader or get ahead of your story. The reader is trying to think, OK, what is going to happen now? What will happen next? And unless uh, 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 you're, the way you write, uh, it basically is building that imagination of his or hers who's reading that book. So for me, uh, language is uh, language is important to the extent that it creates an imagery in the mind, and that is regardless of what kind of writing that you do. Um, uh, however, as far as what your choice of words or your you know whether, whether your la your language is concerned, I had uh, you know I there was something which one of my Sanskrit teachers in school had told me, and I and I have always tried to you know I remember it. 
he said that you know when you are writing you should not be looking for words to express yourself the words must come to you and say give me a chance to express myself and that's the way i use uh, words and language and what in fact sometimes i do uh, you know i i do write something and i keep going back to it and changing it because i believe that it's not giving the correct sense of what i want to convey perhaps it's not providing the kind of imagery that it should and that's that's the way i look at it Uh, but but there is is there certain emotion that you're trying to influence when when you know you are you are trying to reach to your readers no no i i don't uh, not i'm not trying to it's not trying to influence but i believe that when i'm describing something okay or for for example if it's a character if it's a place if it's a mansion whatever it is the the imagery which it conjures in the minds of the reader has to be satisfying it has to be rich and that to that extent the language must support you the words must support you that's the way i look at it okay so um now this is this is a you know question that uh, is is um, close to my heart uh, just wanted to i mean you know this is uh, on the light note is there any in- interesting writing quirk that you have is a particular font that you write in or or you know uh, there's a particular music that you listen to is is there any interest interesting quirk uh behind you writing or how you write you can you want to take that uh-huh. yeah to me uh, see initially when i started writing and i was submitting manuscripts uh, to publishers uh, the standard is you write in a4 if you are in europe or india uh, with uh, um with 12 uh, times 12 okay uh, is your uh, standard then i did that for the first couple of novels two three novels then after that i said you know it doesn't i want to see some i want to see the words as close as possible right uh, when it will be published so what i did was i went i started changing the paper size and the font so that oh, even they are say write it it looks very similar to how it will be when it's printed now the reason i found that very useful is that the way you distribute paragraphs where you give uh, uh, paragraph breaks line breaks they do have a relevance when you are actually reading the book and i was ignoring all of that when i was doing the uh, a4 size so this is probably the only close thing to quirk uh, i've come to but um i see the other thing is i sometimes change fonts uh one confession i am mildly dyslexic so uh, my reading i have spelling problems i look at words and i when i look at one word but i my mind reads it as some other word so in order to fix that what i do is when i review my books i change the font i make it from times i may make it uh, you know uh, courier so that the image that my eyes see are different from what i wrote so this is something is more i do this to kind of make up for for my drawback in terms of being dyslexic otherwise nothing else okay what about you bhaskar do, do you have i've any- got i've got a very strange quirk i um, you know when i when i'm writing i keep going back to what i have written so for example if i have started writing and i write four lines i go back and read those four lines before i write the next <laughs> and i keep doing that so what happens is i keep reading and rereading whatever i have written because i somehow feel that it helps with the flow that's what i feel rather than finishing it and then going back to it so that's something which perhaps delays me a lot when i'm doing my writing the second quirk which i have is i'm fundamentally never satisfied with what i write so once i have written something i will go back to it perhaps change it even when i've submitted something there's a feeling that okay you know there maybe this should have been different so it this and, and i enjoy this continuous feeling of dissatisfaction which i have it's a very strange thing but you know you ask for a quirk so there it is so there are two things i keep re- reading and rereading whatever i've written so four lines i'll go back read it and then eight lines i'll go back and read the eight lines before i continue and that's it so that's my quirk do you do you uh, read your book reviews how do you receive them mm i read my book reviews um i receive them completely passively um because a book review is a one it's a personal opinion second the person may or may not like it uh for a number of reasons uh I, he he or she may not be my target to for whom i'm uh, writing and there's a huge variation in a reader's state of mind uh that affects whether 
he or she likes it or not. You know, uh, if you're being inter, if you if a reader gets interrupted four times, five times, seven times, the person is not going to enjoy it as much as the person would have read it in one shot. Now, the other thing is that once you have published a book, and somebody has spent money to buy it, he or she has the complete right to say what they want to say. Uh, you may disagree with it. You may feel that um, this person doesn't understand what I'm writing. See, it happens to me very often with my corporate thrillers uh, because it does call for a certain uh, level of understanding of the corporate world. If you're talking about insider trading, at least mota moti, you need to know what is uh, the stock market. If you're talking about loan fraud, you need to know what is loan fraud. Now, there are some readers who are not used to these kind of books and uh, maybe they come and pick this up and it goes over their head and they can leave a comment. I shouldn't take it seriously, right? So that's how it is. And then when I move from corporate thrillers to my to Will to Quill, which is a domestic um, uh, jo domestic mystery, many of my readers who were expecting a corporate crime came and read this and said, boss, this is not a thriller. This is a, a mystery. It's a slower book. Yes. So they leave comments based on that. So I take it. I read all of it. I internalize it. And then there are many of the things I would accept, many I would not accept and just go on. All right. So uh, do good reviews uh, give you a feeling of high? The, do they satisfy that, you know, yes, you know, uh, the point that you're trying to make or is, is being appreciated or, you know, your story has been well received? Initially, yes. In the first few years of my writing career, yes. Uh, now you realize, in, I've been writing since 2012, so it's eight years. Now you realize that there will be ups and downs. None of it, you know, it's the collective that matters. Some people will trash your book. Many guys will say good things. It doesn't give me as much as a high, although a good review gives my wife a huge high. It doesn't give me as much. Okay. What about you, Bhaskar? You know, there is something which I was taught in the corporate world and I, I, and I use and I feel that very strongly. Uh, you know, when, whenever we used to get customer complaints in banks, our, our seniors is to say, if the customer is complaining, he's still, he's still bothered about you. Because if the customer is disillusioned, he'll just walk away. He will not tell you good or bad. I approach my reviews exactly the same way. Okay. So whether the review is good or bad, it basically means that this, it has touched him emotionally, positively or negatively. And, and for me, that's a huge positive. And yes, of course, if I feel that there is something I can glean, because you know, at the end of the day, we are all apprentices. No, no one is a master here. So we have to keep polishing our craft. So to that extent, if I feel that there's something which is going to add to my, or you know, improve my way of doing it, yes, I will. But at this, at, at, by the same token, people have different points of view, right? So you, there's an extent to which you can accommodate it. But yes, whether the reviews positive or negative, both give me a high because it means that this person is invested in my book. That's such a nice way of looking at it. Thank, thank you so much for the for that uh, you know uh, reply. I mean, I'm going to take it as a life lesson. Uh, so uh, now I want to understand from both of you, has, has writing changed you as a person, helped you become a better version of yourself in any way? Can you throw so, some light on that? Okay. Um, you know, I was asked this question sometime back also, has writing changed you as a reader? It's a different question, but similar to what you're saying. Yes, it has changed me as a reader. Now what is happening is earlier I used to, find the twists and turns and the dilemma that comes at the end when a murder is announced. Uh, very often it used to give me a huge kick. Now what is happening is that as after I started writing, when I'm reading a mystery book and there are lots that I have not yet read, um, I find that I more than half the time I'm predicting what is happening because how, my mind is now thinking as a writer what was disclosed about this character, what was not disclosed about this character, how was it set up, all those things give me messages, which I was not receiving when I was not a writer. So my enjoyment of, uh, of crime fiction has actually reduced a little bit after, uh, after writing. So uh, that is the uh, change, but as overall as a person, I, I don't think there has been any change as far as I'm concerned, it's the same guy. Okay. What about you, Bhaskar? Very, very difficult to say how it has changed you. Um, but I think uh, one has become more aware of whatever one observes. Because very often, especially when I'm right, I do write a lot about human relationships. It's very important to 
try and put yourselves in the other person's shoes okay and i think i have started doing that a lot more after i've started writing to and I, because it helps me to give a get a different perspective on whatever is happening rather than thinking bearing my hat other than that i don't think it has changed me as a person yes it has all made me more conscious that i need to get more disciplined in my writing and uh, so on but otherwise i don't think there's been too much okay now uh, we'll move on to the next uh, segment of i mean you know we are uh almost an hour but i i think you know this is a, this a question is very important and uh, uh to a lot of people who are uh, attending a session today how do you get your books published it's it's a burning question for for every aspiring author and writer uh could you so throw some light on the subject please okay so fundamentally it's going to depend on what kind of publishing you want to do right there are various types of publishing you have traditional publishing you have vanity publishing you have self publishing i'm a three spots in the continuous spectrum if you want to get traditionally published that is you get published by a reputed uh, publisher the best way to do it now is to first get yourself uh, an agent because you know when i was writing about 8 years back 10 years back there were publishers accepting uh, submissions from directly uh, now the it has become less far less right and all of them have huge slush piles so your chances improve significantly if you can get yourself a, an agent and there are enough and more agents in india now if you want to do vanity publishing vanity publishing as a definition it is it's for people's own vanity you pay the money and you get it published quality is no bar uh, the standard is no hurdle nothing so whatever you get will get published if you want to do that there are resilient people there who will do it right there is no hurdle at all um one of the interesting things is self publishing which is neither vanity publishing nor uh, uh, traditional publishing this is if you go to kdp the uh, let's say kindle uh, pub direct publishing there if you have a good word document everything else is taken care of you can go and publish it uh, and you will have to do your own uh, uh, your own advertisement and all that stuff now so coming back to the question of do you want to get published if you want to do vanity you can just do whatever you believe same thing is applicable for self publishing also you can go to kindle but if you want traditional publish and if it is not mythology or romance or some of those uh, uh, genres which sell in huge volumes today then you have to go through an agent and i would say that a good agent is a filter herself um so oh, before you submit something you need to have a good sense of where will it fit in the market right to give you an example when i started writing fraudster uh, which has turned out to be a thriller first i started the first version was a murder mystery it was a locked room mystery uh and then when I, halfway through i said listen nobody knows me and this is probably too slow today uh, most people will not buy a christie novel if it is not by christie so it's too slow and i felt very uh, strongly that uh, i need to change that when i spoke to somebody else they kind of confirmed that so i changed it to a thriller so there is so your your agent is going to look for things like uh how does your story flow how are the characters but most importantly is there a space in the market so for me it worked first try because there were no corporate thrillers in india uh so if you're going to write a me too book you're going to have difficulty getting a agent as well so even before you start writing you need to give some thought as to where are you going to fit in the market you compare the indian market and the overseas market you will find a lot of flaws pick up one of them what you're comfortable with don't force yourself to do something for example i can never write something like what bashwar writes if i try to do it it will just it will fall flat if i try to try and say that there is no good humor in india at least indian books right if i were to try and write like um, the pg what house it will fall flat because i just don't have the ability so you have to do that internal introspection look at the market say what am i looking at and then find yourself a good agent this would be my suggestion 
Uh, what about you, Basu? What, what are your thoughts on this? I think uh, Venkat has given a very, very comprehensive response. Uh, I just want to add a couple of things. The first is that, uh, you know, when you write something and you obviously, you know, you totally believe in what you are doing, right? It's very important to get your own effort beta read by people. And if you want, you should be getting it beta read by people across different age categories, because it also depends on who is your audience, who you want your audience to be in the market, so that you get a good enough feedback about what is it that you are trying to put out there. So that's the first thing. Second thing is there is definitely a distinction between fiction and nonfiction publishing. Nonfiction publishing is far easier than fiction. Let us to be very realistic. A one, uh, you know, one lakh copies hit the market every year. That's the, I believe the figures. And obviously in that clutter, you're going to get lost unless you are you know, able to create some space. And the three uh, you know, methods is what Venkat has already spoken about. Uh, but yes, a lot of people, because they sincerely believe that their work is good, have gone the self-publishing route. And even if you look at the big guys, if you look at guys like Amish, etc., they were all self-published before somebody picked them up, right? Or even if you look someone like Grisham, okay, uh, who sold his first 5,000 books from his own garage. So you have to be convinced about your kind of work, right? And I think that is that is very, very important. Like, for example, my first novel, which has been there for quite some time, it's been with me for three years. I've approached a number of people and they've all told me I need to change the ending because it's a cross genre. It is a thriller with magic realism and I've refused to do it. Okay. All right. And I take my strength from someone like Daniel Keyes, whose book I really love. That's one of my favorite books, Plas for Algernon, who was, you know, who was rejected by 17 publishers, but he refused to change the book even one bit. And then finally, I think Hardcourt or someone published him. So I think A, your conviction about what you have written, but even if you have a conviction, get that tested with people to make sure that, you know, you have written something which is, uh, which is good. And the third thing is otherwise, you know, go the route of self-publishing because the traditional publishing, unless, you know, you're someone, you know, of, uh, 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 like Venkat had, he got into a space which allowed him. It's extremely tough. It's tortuous. It's, it's long drawn out. It takes years to get traditionally published. And today, what we are discovering also is even the large publishers, someone like a Rupa, et cetera, are asking people to kind of put in money if they want to get published. So they have moved into the venture vanity publishing space. So those kind of issues have also started begun, begun to come in because publishers are now finding it increasingly difficult to sustain themselves, especially in the light of what we are seeing currently. Okay. Okay. Well, what is the brand value of a publishing house? How, how important is that? You know, when I was a kid, my dad, and when we went to bookstores, it was middle class, so there's always a shortage of money. And I used to want to pick up three, four different books. And he'd say, no, your quota is one. So I said, which do I pick up? So he used to tell me, if it's a penguin, it must be good. Right? That's what he used to tell me. Uh, but today, uh, that's not the case at all. Uh, I don't think in India, there is no brand differentiation. In fact, uh, in my class that I teach at IIM Trichy, I, I teach business strategy from a consulting perspective, uh, strategy consulting. Uh, one of the case studies I give them in the class is exactly this. Uh, the uh, publishing is one area where the brand is not at all built in India. Overseas, it's very different. There are specific brands. It's also a question of the market size, blah, blah, all that was there. But in my view, India, the publishers have not differentiated at all. Those who had some differentiation have lost, for example, Penguin. What are your thoughts, Basfur, on this? Um, so I have been not as fortunate as Venkat to have been published by the big guys. So for me, that name still holds a thrill. And I would obviously be over the moon if, uh, you know, a big publisher picked up my book. But this, and I'm sure that's with even, even here. I mean, you would prefer a, a Penguin or a Bloomsbury or a Harper Collins to pick up your book rather than, uh, you know, a smaller publisher. But having said that, one of the things which is, which I have noticed is that even if a big publisher does pick up your book, the kind of marketing effort that they will give behind a new author is going to be far less than an established author. And that is something you have to keep in mind. That just because you've got a big name, because see, at the end of the day, writing is the easier part of the whole process. Marketing and uh, you know is the much more difficult part if someone were to frankly ask me, right? So therefore, if you're going to a big name, please note that the budgets they have for you is that much lesser than what they would have for a big guy. Okay. If I can just add a little bit, 
you know, you ask an average reader who has, let's say, read a book uh, uh, three weeks back, you ask her, who, okay, which book did you read? Such and such a book. Who's the author? This is the name. Who's the publisher? Don't know. So most uh, consumers of reading don't seem to even look at the publisher, which essentially means that the brands have not been built. So I, I think you know uh, the credibility of publishing uh, publishing houses are are more among the the authors than you know the from from a reader's perspective. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, before we just you know open for Q and A, well, one last question: Do you have any advice for for you know uh, aspiring writers and authors? Me, I really don't have any advice about writing. Um, because there's so much out in the internet, there's tons and tons of it, I can't add to it. Uh, only suggestion I would make is that do it for your enjoyment, don't do it for sales. Because if you do it for sales, you're not going to like it very much. And I would say 99 out of 100 people who start writing are going to face blog, uh, all kinds of roadblocks. Um, and uh, a very, very rare person is going to become a bestseller sales are not going to take off. If you want to enjoy that as a hobby, as something that you do, I think that is great. Then you will be far happier. Uh, your thoughts? I totally, I totally agree with that. Uh, it must, A, you, I have, and a lot of people have told me this and I've, I've been asked this question, saying that, you know, I'm not being able to give enough time to my writing. So I just want to kick whatever I'm doing in my job and give it, give full time. I just want to give myself three years. And I tell them, don't do that. It's harakiri. Don't ever do that because, do you know, this will not, it will only get you very, very frustrated. You have to realize that you have to start off with this just as a hobby, just like any other hobby you have. But yes, over a period of time, try, like with any other hobby, try to improve upon it. Try to take feedback from people. Try to see how you can improve your craft. Read a lot more. Because, you know, typically when you, when you want to start writing, I mean, you know, you should, you should be an avid reader. Because it helps you, it helps you to open up your vistas. You know, your your mind opens up a lot more. But treat it like a hobby. Enjoy writing. Enjoy putting it out there. And you must put it out there. I think so. So regardless of whichever platform you select, whether it's self-publishing, if you've if you've got the money, vanity publishing, or if you get picked up by a, by a publishing house, put it out there. That's very important. I think you should do that. It doesn't matter if it doesn't it doesn't succeed. Just enjoy the process. You know, the first few pieces that you write uh, are going to be horrendous, right? You go back after two years and then read it and say, my God, is this what I wrote? That's how it's going to be, right? It's going to be really bad. But you have to cross that bridge. And because your, your perspective also keeps changing, right? Yeah. So that, that also happens. Okay. Uh, we'll uh, open to uh, Q&A now from, from the audience. Sure. So, uh, there, there was something before. We, they have put the questions on the chat window, uh, Priyanka. Yes. So uh, Surya had a question, uh, and I am assuming it is it is uh, for the both of you. Uh, can you guide us about how to reach publishers and translators? Translators, I don't know. Um, publishers, like I said uh, earlier, I think if you want traditional publishing, it's best to get an agent. If you can't get an agent, see, basically you need a contact inside which will make the editor or the publisher give your manuscript 10 minutes. That's all you can achieve, right? Uh, so if you can't go through an agent, go through somebody. If you know somebody who knows a publishing editor, just that one word will at least ensure that your document, your manuscript is read. After that is a question of whether it fits or not, right? So I have nothing to add beyond what I had said earlier. Yeah, I think I have nothing to add. That's that's what it is. <clears throat> okay. And I, I have no idea about translations, uh, translators. Sorry. Okay. Uh, now this question is for Bhaswar. Uh, can you share references about two art conflict stories? Story. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Can art you conflict share? story. Art or heart? Heart, heart. Two heart conflict stories. Okay, so there was this. Uh, um, we want examples of hard conflict stories, is it? Is that the question? Sorry, uh, uh, Priyanka. Can, can you share references about the two hard conflict story? 
Oh yeah, are you are, is someone talking about the cover of my book or are they because there are two hearts there is someone is reaching out for the two hearts is that the question or is the question uh, Su Surya was asking for this question so uh, I I would raise uh, raised the hand I think so if you can ask what yeah I would can... request him to you know give more clarity on this question if you can just unmute Surya maybe because I need to understand the question uh yes. Surya, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. And I've given you the. Uh, thank you, Rohini. Good morning, uh, Mr. Raman. Good morning, Bhasar. Hi, Surya. Tell me. So, uh, see, there was one story of yours where a girl is uh, having two hearts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The dilemma of a heart or the other way around. I don't know what which story you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember the stories very well, but I'm poor at remembering titles. No, Even no, though I have the book next to me. I was lazy enough not to refer to it. Sorry for that. No, no worries. I'm telling you, it's a dialogue. No, but uh, how did you, uh, is, is it really feasible for someone to have two hearts, one thinking like a boy and uh, the other thinking like a girl? Or oh. is it a uh, piece of fiction? No, it was again based on a prompt. So the prompt was about a girl who has two hearts. Mm -hmm. So that was a prompt of the story, which was given by, uh, I can't remember who it was. But uh, which author it was, but that was the prompt of the story. So I had to create a story around it. So in my story, I, I, I created this concept that the one of the heart was beating for a girl and the other for a boy. And then, of course, uh, you know, the boy has needs a heart replacement and this girl is worried which heart will she give him? Mm. Because if she gives him the wrong heart, all hell will break loose. Exactly. So I was wondering whether it was a piece of fiction or uh, it is really possible because I thought it may not be really possible. <laughs> No, it was it was from the prompt. So the prompt had the premise of the two hearts. So okay. I just developed on it. That's all. The uh, the prompt need not be factual. Let no. us presume so. No. So the prompt okay. is given, and then you can paint your own canvas around it, unless they've got very strong restrictions. Like Anita Nair had a restriction that you have to have an animal in your story. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know those those kind of restrictions were put by the authors in addition to the prompt. Then then it becomes all the more challenging. Wow! It's wonderful. I'm putting my thumbs up. Okay, I'll put a thumbs up here. There is, there was one thumbs up uh, sign somewhere. Anyway, the, thanks both of you for uh, for a very enlightening discussion. Thanks a lot. I would let others uh, ask questions. I'll mute myself. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Surya. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Shashwati Mukherjee has has you know uh, very interesting and, and exciting questions. And uh, some are uh, for uh, one of the question is for Venkat, and I think uh, the other two are uh, uh, you know general questions uh, uh, to to the both of you. Uh, to Venkat, she wants to ask: Do you face writer's block? Uh, <laughs> my own view is that I'm sorry you're <laughs> saying this, but my own view is that writer's block is a fancy phrase when you don't feel like writing. You know, sometimes words just flow; sometimes they just don't. Uh, weeks pass, months pass, you can't write. Now, to call it a writer's block, I think is a little too much. I mean, do poets face blocks? Do singers face, uh, face blocks? Do plumbers uh, face blocks? I don't know. It is sometimes you want to write, sometimes you can't. It is the case with every creative pursuit. Now, it's only in writing that we give it a status of writer, writer's block and uh, give it more importance than it deserves, is my view. Uh, but that's just a personal view. So, I don't believe. Uh, um, in writer's uh, She again asked, you know, what are common traps for aspiring uh, that uh, aspiring writers should avoid? Common traps that aspiring writers should avoid. Common traps, is it? Okay. Traps. Okay. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. I I'm just going to go off the cuff here. Um, I find. Many new writers trying to bamboozle their readers with language, right? Uh, this is your um, your manuscript is not a place to start filling with your GMAT uh, vocabulary list, right? So I think lots of people do it. In fact, there is a published author who does it. Crime writer writes about um, uh, stories set in the uh, in, during British India. 
um, I think it's faced a lot of criticisms because um, uh, you just deluge the uh, the reader with uh, with words, fancy words. Uh, so that is something I would say you avoid. Um, the second thing is let. Okay, this is something seriously. I mean, when you are writing a novel, that is not about short stories. Maybe true for short stories also, but when you're writing a novel, any scene that you put in. It has to achieve something. It can't just be there, right? It either has to move the story along or it has to enlighten, throw light on a character or something, right? Very often you find that this doesn't happen. And this advice is something you will find on the internet also, what I've told you. The problem this creates is that when you assemble your, all your uh, chapters and you start reading, the pace goes up and down. When a scene is there which does nothing, it, you lose your reader. And very often, the, the reason I'm saying that is that when I'm writing, I fall in love with my words. I want to keep it there. But you're a good editor would look at it and say, okay, wonderful words, but what is it doing in the story? Chuck it out. So this is another style of trap that I can think of where we get uh, overly fond of what we wrote. So as I think of more, maybe Bashwar can add. I just want to add something about writer's block. I think the word writer's block came about because at one point of time, writing was a full profession, right? Now, what we are advocating today is that keep it as a hobby, not as a profession. So therefore, if your bread and butter starts depending on it, you cannot have you know weeks and months of silence from your pen. You have to start writing. That's where the writer's block, I think, was really important as a, as a phraseology. Uh, now, in, in terms of the traps, um, the first is, of course, uh, believing that you know you have written you have written, whatever you have created is the next best thing to sliced bread you have to believe that there are people who have created perhaps something much better than you so very often what happens is as you know we we get so caught so so enamored by what we have created because yes it's got, you know a lot of sweat and toil and uh, you know time has gone behind it but then uh, make sure that you uh, do do some kind of a what we call reality check Okay, <clears throat> and yes, uh, unless a, a particular a, a, a particular flow or a particular uh, uh, piece of the writing is not really gelling with the rest of the story, one has to be careful to avoid it. Venkat, I think, has already spoken about it. Other than that, uh, you know. Yeah, let me just add one more thing, Priyanka. Um, this again, a personal opinion. See, it is it's very easy to take some overseas story right dan brown or somebody else and just put the thing in indian context and write a novel right uh, some people do that it doesn't work very well I, the thing is if part of your in the, part of the reason behind your writing is that people you want people to read your writing and say okay this guy writes well his his ideas are good and he's reasonably original if you want to earn respect please don't go and take something which dan brown wrote and chop out in india Right? Uh, it's not going to sell. I think increasingly we have got to a stage with Indian publishers where uh, they don't buy these uh, Me Too things. So that is, uh, it's one thing to take inspiration from another book, but it's a different thing to take that plot and put Indian characters. I also want to add something else. Um, people want to read you. People don't want to read a Me Too. So what I actually consciously do is when I uh, when I'm writing, I actually don't read a lot because there is always a tendency of getting influenced by somebody's style. Yeah, I consciously avoid it. Okay, um, you know, so it might it could be a Murakami or whoever it is, but I will not touch. You know, I will read about his marathon p p p exploits, but I'll not read his books because I have a very I, I keep fearing that it's going to creep into my writing, and then I become a me too. Nobody wants a me too. Okay. Uh, Vivek has a question. I think I'll just uh, unmute him that you know he can ask the question himself. Vivek, call. Anji Vivek, I think you can ask your question yourself. I think he's muted. I can't hear him. Can't hear you. I think we have lost. Uh, uh, no, I can no, see his video, but uh, I can't hear him. Maybe we can read his question. Yes, I'll I'll do that. 
uh, does the mindset of non-fiction writing vary significantly from fiction writing? I believe so. Uh, in my view, yes. Uh, see, I haven't written non-fiction, but in my uh, career as a corporate advisor, we've written a lot of documents uh, which are essentially non-fiction, um, where you are either advising the companies or you're um, talking about the future trends of something. Uh, I think the mindset is very different. The phraseology is, is very different. In my view, writing, fic uh, writing non-fiction, you have to stick to the facts. You have to present it in a certain way. Uh, right? Fiction is, at least for me, letting your imagination fly. Uh, and uh, I think the way in which a story is assembled is very different from which from the way in which an argument is as assembled in a nonfiction. Uh, very different is my view. I would agree with that. I think uh, nonfiction essentially is information, knowledge, education, and fiction is entertainment. Of course, you can always leave a good moral story, or you can, you know, perhaps link it with something which is happening around. But that's the fundamental difference. So therefore, you need to stick to a lot more of facts when you're writing, uh, you know, an information, credible information when you're writing nonfiction. Okay. Uh, Vikrant has a question. Uh, let me try if I can, you know, unmute him that uh, he can ask the question himself. No, no, I, I, Priyanka, I didn't have a question. I was just answering Vivek's uh, point. Okay, all right, all right, okay, okay. Uh, do we uh, have any other questions for, for, for our panelists or uh, is it all? I, I guess uh, we are uh, done with the Q and A. Good. So uh, we can uh, wrap up. I mean, uh, we are a little uh, sixteen minutes o overboard than what we decided, but we uh, started late also. Hanji, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let let me wind up. Uh, I would like to thank the both of you for taking out time from your busy schedules and sharing your journey and learnings as authors with us all. I would also like to thank our wonderful audience who took the effort and you know time of their Saturday morning to be here and uh, make this uh, session even more interesting. And uh, as, as you know, a part and representative of the alumni office, uh, we look forward to having uh, many more such uh, of interactive uh, sessions with you all in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank thanks you, everyone. Priyanka. Thank you, audience. Thanks for everything. Thanks. It was a good, it was a good session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks.